Good morning. Great to be here to share the word. I downloaded Nathan's message last week and it's on YouTube. If you don't come to church, you can download it. It was a great message. I was uh, encouraged. So it's my joy to, uh, to share part two um, on this theme of life in the Spirit, life in the Holy Spirit. I want to share about God's gracious gifts today and particularly the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism in the Spirit and the ability to worship him with a brand new prayer language, a hotline to heaven that bypasses normal intelligible speech that uh, makes my spirit, my heart be so connected to him that he is up close and real and personal. Um, just three things I want to share today and that is that our Heavenly Father has graciously provided for us and all our needs through Jesus Christ. God is really good, okay? He never gives bad things to people, only good things. Bad things happen to good people, but God is always, his essential nature is he is goodness personified. Uh, he, he cannot do evil. He cannot do bad things. We do bad things because we fall away from him and don't follow his, his love laws and, and place our dependency upon him. But God, our Heavenly Father, has graciously provided for us through Jesus Christ. He calls us to himself and uh, provides us with all sorts of good things. Uh, he calls us to to become Christians. And uh, sometimes we think it's our decision to become a Christian. It's, it's my will and my decision and by my strength that I am saved. Uh, in the Gospel of John, it says that uh, it's not the will of man or, or a human decision, but it's the will of God. And he draws us to himself through the Holy Spirit and uh, gives us the gift of, of salvation, a relationship with him. And uh, he initiates the relationship. It wasn't, we don't start it. We're dead in our sins and transgressions. And dead men can do nothing about their, their state. And so it took God himself to send Christ and to open our eyes to see love expressed in such an amazing way on the cross, to sacrifice his life to save us. And then through the Holy Spirit, once our eyes are opened, he gives us new life. So see, dead men can't repent. Dead men can't believe. Dead men can do nothing. And so it takes the life of God, it takes our gracious Father through the Holy Spirit to actually open our eyes to see that the gift of eternal life and real meaning in life comes through faith in Jesus when we look at him hanging on a cross for us. And he died and was buried and rose again and he sends the gift of the Holy Spirit so that our hearts can be renewed. And so you can't become a Christian in your by your own volition or your own strength. It takes God himself to regenerate us and to what's dead on the inside, he gives new life through the Holy Spirit. And so that's the greatest gift of all, I reckon, the gift of salvation, a new relationship with him. Forgiveness for all of our sins. Anyone not sinned this week? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Past, present and future, our sins are covered because Christ's blood was shed once and for all, the book of Hebrews says. And uh, it covers our weakness, it covers our mistakes, it covers our sins. And uh, we have forgiveness. Not, we can't earn it, it's granted to us by putting our trust in Jesus Christ and keep turning to him. We have peace with our Heavenly Father. And uh, he gives us his presence and peace on the inside and, and the ability to be able to have relationships that are peaceful. And he takes war out of our hearts because we're no longer at war with him and we're at peace with him and therefore peace comes into our soul and we can have peaceful relationships with, with those around about us. There are life principles he gives us through his word, but they're not just dead letters. He gives us his, his transforming power through the spirit to take those life principles and apply them. So some people read the Bible and think it's a bunch of rules and if I do this and do that then somehow God will be pleased and, and, and I'll be okay. But God is pleased with us when we place our trust in him, when we say I depend upon him 
And then he gives us his Holy Spirit so that he can enable us to be able to follow the life principles of his word. And they become alive. The dead letter cannot save and heal. It's only the life-giving spirit. And so when God's word and God's spirit are working together in our lives, amazing things take place. Transformation occurs. Answered prayer is a provision from our heavenly father. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are so many blessings. The list goes on and on. And each one of the blessings of our loving heavenly father were provided for us at great expense. And that's the death of Christ on a cross, secured them for us. I love this, this passage of scripture. Over the past couple of weeks, this one has become really meaningful to me personally. I love it. I mean, I know it and I've preached on it and re- written it out many times, but oh, look at this. What then shall we say in response to these things? And when Paul is talking about the problem of pain and suffering and evil and and difficulties in our world. What shall we say? If God is for us, say it with me, who can be against us? And look at this. He gives the reason. He who did not spare his own son, wow, but gave him up for us all, for you and me, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Wow, whatever you need. Our Heavenly Father knows, and He so wants to give us His presence and power and provision to meet our needs. He is good. This is what our Heavenly Father's like. He has graciously provided us with everything we need through Jesus. However, we've got to pay pay close attention to this. And sometimes it's easy to drift away. And it's sad when people drift away. And don't revel in, in, in what God has provided. Look at the scripture in Hebrews 2. It's a wake-up call, this scripture. And um, let's pay close attention to what God, our loving heavenly dad, has provided for us. He says, we must pay, the writer of Hebrews, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away, which is easy to do. And look at this, regarding the Old Testament. Because for if the message spoken by angels was binding, the law and uh, the, the social, moral, ethical framework that God gave to the Hebrew people was binding. He goes, for if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received as just punishment, I mean, they got into trouble if they didn't follow the law. Now we're under grace where we understand the law in the Old Testament. But look what he says here, the writer. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? What I've just shared with you about God the Father's provisions, the most precious thing in life. This salvation, which was first announced by Jesus himself, the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, Peter, James, John, and all the other apostles. God also testified In other words, he he speaks, he proclaims, and he demonstrates. Jesus proclaimed the message of God the Father, and he demonstrated it with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Wow, the supernatural, miraculous works of God testify of God's reality. It gives us positive proof and confirmation that his word is true. You know, I'm just so thankful that our Christian faith is not just a cognitive faith. It's not just a rational faith. It's not just uh, a propositional faith. You know, one plus one plus one equals three. It's not saying, well, follow these propositions and just think about them and believe them in your head and you're a Christian. It's not religion. It's not based just on propositions. It's an experiential faith. It is a lived out faith. It's felt. It is seen. It's not just thought about. And so we have God himself living in us. I mean, that's amazing. You think about that. That God the Father sends his son to deal with the issue that separated us from him. 
He dies on the cross, buried, he rises again. He goes back to heaven, but doesn't leave us on our own. Jesus said, look, I'm going. And they, and they were crying, the disciples, don't go, Jesus, don't go. And he says, look, it's better that I go because I can only be with you guys. But when I send the spirit who is just like me, he'll be with you and he'll be with millions of people at the same time. And so the Holy Spirit, I love what Nathan shared last week, you know, like some translations have the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Ghost, ooh, ghosts among you, you know, like spooky, weird. And I don't like using that term. We say Holy Spirit, spirit means non-corporal, non-physical. Uh, he, like our Heavenly Father, is non-physical. He is spiritual. Jesus is corporal. Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal son, will always have a corporal physical body. He'll always look like a 33-year-old Palestinian Jew that's been massacred, beaten, crucified. The marks of what they did to his body will be there forever to remind us, reminds us that's what our salvation, it cost him his life. And so we see here that that God himself now sends his spirit. And you want to know what the Holy Spirit's like? He is just like Jesus. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit's like, read the four gospels of what Jesus said and what he did and how he acted and reacted. The Holy Spirit's exactly the same. Same nature. Same will and heart and purpose. Just different person. So don't be spooked out by the spirit. So when he comes, it's like heaven comes and invades your body. Where is heaven? Heaven is right within you inside of you. So, wow, I thought it was past Mars and past... No, it's not out there, you know? Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader who was full of pride when the Sputnik went up in, 19, in the 1950s and sent up the rockets, and he said, we went up there, we can't find heaven, there's no God there. What a foolish man. Where is heaven? Heaven's within you. Why? Because God is within you. God lives in heaven. So, so when we pass on from this life, I, I can't use, hate the term, you know, the person has passed away. What is that? You don't pass away. You pass on. You either pass on to heaven or you pass on to hell. There's no, and, and I'm so thankful by the grace of God that all of us here, we're passing on to heaven. But where is heaven? It's another dimension. The moment a person leaves, and I've, I've seen people who have left this life, and, and uh, one of the privileges of, of, of my pastoral ministry is to help some people pass from this life to the next. And I tell you, when that happens, it's like, wow, the presence. You feel like there are angels around you. If you, you don't want to see them because you'll freak out. You'll probably die of a heart attack. It's like, all of a sudden, it's like, a manifestation of the reality that heaven is another dimension right next to us. It's right there. There are angels looking in right now, but you can't see them. So it's another dimension. It's not a place, a physical place. In the book of Revelation, a lot of people take that totally literal when it's meant to be a beautiful symbolic picture. And one day, one day, there's going to be a new earth created. But heaven is, is where, where the Father, the Son, where his angels, where people, have, it's real. It's more real than this physical world of ours because the immaterial made the material. But it's not some place out there, it's another dimension and we slip into it the moment we pass on for those who have faith in him. And so you've got heaven on the inside. You've got all the resources of heaven and of God living within you, the Holy Spirit. You've got Christ. Why Paul uses terminology like Christ is in you? But you say, well, what do you mean, Paul? He's in heaven. And he goes, oh, the Spirit of Jesus is in you. Oh, no, it's the Holy Spirit. Because he is saying the Spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And it's like having Jesus physically with you, walking with you. So we're much better off because you can have Jesus walking with you, living in you. And so can hundreds of millions of people at the same time. Wow, this is amazing. So we must pay close attention to these things. And uh, the, the, the signs, wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This is experiential. This is real. This is not propositional. This is meant to be lived out by all of us. And so the second thing I want to say is, what Jesus now offers us through the Holy Spirit, who now indwells all who are believers. If you're a believer, 
You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. So in talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gift of being able to speak in a new prayer language, that's not receiving the Holy Spirit for the first time. You can't be a Christian unless the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned earlier, draws you to believe. He draws you to believe. And then when you do believe, he comes and lives within you. And so baptism in the Spirit and the gift of being able to speak in a new prayer language becomes a doorway by which God says now, I want not just to live in you, I want to flow out of you. There are people in need, and Jesus needs to minister to those people. So how is Jesus going to minister to them if he's locked up inside of us? And we say, well, I just want Jesus for myself, and beautiful character, the fruit of the Spirit. I just want the fruit of the Spirit. I just want love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness. I just want him to grow in me. And Well, that's part of it, the character of Christ living in us. But he also says, I want the charisma of Jesus flowing out of you to help people in need because that's what Jesus does. Wherever there was a need, in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, he couldn't help himself. And so the, the, the real born again, spirit filled Christian cannot help himself, cannot help herself. The more spirit filled we are, the more loving we'll become, the more giving we become. The more selfless we become, the more Christ-like, the more we want to give to people. What are we going to give them? We don't know what to give them. We need the Holy Spirit who's within us flowing out of us with charisma, gifts. So we need all the fruit that he produces in us, character. We need that. And we need all the gifts flowing through us to be able to serve his purposes and be like Jesus here on this earth. And so... What Jesus now offers us through the Holy Spirit is this. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 12. I've got to read this, this passage. The classic passage that Paul writes about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now to the pastors alone, to the leaders of the church alone, they're the ones that minister and the Spirit manifests through them. Is that what he says? What's he saying? To who? Each one, you should say, now to me, to me, to me, to me, to each one, to each person, the manifestation of the Spirit, not the concept of the Spirit, not just ideas, the manifestation, the manifest presence of God, the Greek word, the, the apocalypsis, the revelation, it's a manifestation, it's, it's God manifesting himself. Where the heart of Jesus, the hand of Jesus, the, the, the mind of Jesus can flow through us through these gifts. Have a look at what these gifts are. There are nine. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for you to keep them to yourself. So that all the fruit of Christ-likeness grows in you and all the charismata, the gifts, are for you. When you're sick, when you're needy, when you're discouraged, just for you. Is that what he says? He says, for the common good. Now, my transliteration of this is to do as much good to people who need help for today and some hope for tomorrow. Do you know any people like that who need help today and need some hope for tomorrow? About 7 billion people on planet Earth. Your family members, your neighbours, your friends, they need help today. They need hope for tomorrow. And Jesus in us doesn't want to be locked up to say, just for me. If he's placed his fullness of his spirit, he wants to flow through you and he, want to, he wants to manifest gifts, the same gifts that he operated when he walked this earth. And here the apostle Paul tries to list some of them, at least nine. To one, notice this, to one, to another, to another, to one. He's saying everyone. It's not the pastors, it's not the leaders, it's anyone who's a Christian. Now to each one, the manifestation, the revelation, the manifest, this is real, this is felt, this is experience, this is seen, this is tangible, this ain't theory. Every time one operates, it confirms to me the reality that the risen Christ lives within me through the Holy Spirit, every time. 
Every time I speak in tongues, it confirms to me the reality that I have what Peter and James and John experienced in Acts chapter 2. And, and Peter said, this is what Joel talked about, the prophet Joel, that on the last days, that the Spirit would come upon all flesh, men and women, young and old. And he says, this is that. In other words, this is a new form of prophecy. This is a new gift for a new era, a new manifestation, a direct hotline to heaven with God. You don't need a priest. You don't need a building. You don't need a liturgy. You just got God. And he now lives within you and you can talk to him and, and perfectly without bypassing your natural mind even. This is amazing. He says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now he lists them here. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by the, by the means of the same Spirit. You might say, well, what's that mean? Well, look, I get a telephone call yesterday and my wife is sitting next to me and we made a decision to watch a nice movie, cuddle up, have a nice meal, just have some time. I've prepared my message. And I get a call from someone, not from our church, but who, who I know and was involved and they got a trauma and they're troubled. <laughs> it's a family dispute. And I'm thinking, I need this like a hole in the head. I just, want to, I just want to relax, thanks. Can't I have some time off? So I didn't feel like speaking to them. That's the truth. And then I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to say to them in this matter? So it's just right then and there that I think, Lord, I don't feel like it. It's inconvenient right now because this movie is really good. <laughs> but they're in need. They have a few tears and it's just a family dispute and, and a bit ugly and... And so I'm just listening, and, 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 and I just, in my heart, I say, Lord, I, I, I need wisdom right now. I didn't go, oh, let me have 10 minutes of prayer to somehow beg God to give it. Hey, the Spirit's in me. He wants to manifest wisdom because there's a need there. And so as I'm speaking, he didn't, it didn't go, oh, God has now given me a gift of wisdom. God is speaking. You better listen. No, no, no. It just flows so naturally. You pray in your heart. He just gives you the right words to say. To speak it and just bring peace into that situation. We need wisdom, knowledge. The message of knowledge. Particularly as you're reading the Bible. I don't know, for, for me, as I'm reading the Bible, as I'm reflecting on the scriptures, working out what am I going to share on Sunday in my messages. I mean, I know the Bible. I've been reading it for 48 years. I can come up with a nice message I don't want to give nice messages. I want the Holy Spirit to give me a gift of knowledge, to give me insight into a passage that somehow you go, wow, I didn't know that was there. That's a different reading of it. Well, God's speaking to me through the word. Because my task is not to give you a nice Bible study. My task, and the pastors here, is to minister God's word so that it meets your needs and helps you to grow in Christ. And so I'm praying for knowledge. God, give me insight so that I can feed the flock and help people who are not believers to come to faith. And I trust that you pick up some of those gifts of knowledge from the preaching of the word. So when Nathan preached last week, there were some insights there. I'm thinking, man, that's interesting. Where did he get that from? I didn't know that. Probably the Holy Spirit gave him some knowledge on the passage. And he will do that to you as you read. That passage in Romans 8, shall he not graciously give us all things? I'm reading it. And all of a sudden it, does, it shone out. I've known it for years. But with the needs I'm, I'm presently facing, I thought, oh, wow. Let's go right there. And I wrote it out. And I've written it out. I just wrote it out there. Lord, that's manna. That's, that's breakfast today. That's food for my soul. That's, in, that's knowledge. That's insight, wisdom, knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Sometimes you're in a situation and, and you don't have enough faith. And you need a gift of faith. My wife raised me up from a sickbed in the early years of our marriage. I was diagnosed with um, glandular fever and I was sick as a dog. I mean, really sick. <laughs> And typical male, you're sick, but you don't look at the symptoms, you know. You don't go to the doc. So I, I woke up one day, and I thought, what's that in my mouth? And I said, something stuck in my mouth. And, I my mouth and, and there were balloons in there. White balloons. I'm like, what the heck is that? Ah, white balloons stuck in there. My glands had just, just exploded with, with just inflammation. 
Went to the doctor, he fell to love me. Oh, he goes, you, you got it bad, Bill. And diagnosed with glandular fever. He says, you got two months off. <laughs> I just laughed. I said, two months off? <laughs> you realise what I'm in the middle of in church? And like, I think I was the only full-time pastor. And, and, uh, and I just thought, but I was sick. I couldn't even lift my arm. Oh, man. So I'm lying on the bed. I'm thinking, what do I do? I was absolutely faithless. Just like typical man, help me. That's why we have wives, help us, help me, you know, like, no, no faith, just like, and this one thought came into my head, yeah, yeah, that story, Leo Harris in his book, Five Key, uh, Your Faith is Power, the story of King Jehoshaphat and how he put the choir, he put the band in front of the army before they went and beat, the, who was it, the Amalekites or the Midianites, and, and, and they won the battle just with music. Faith, like they're just going for it and they didn't even have to raise their swords. Oh, that's a good, that's a good story. So I got, okay, that's a cat. Just grab Pastor Harris' book and read it to me. So she's reading it to me. And as she's reading it, and then she read the chapter from 2 Chronicles 20. You know what was happening? The word was being ministered to me. I needed somebody. And, and I think a manifestation of a gift of faith came through Kathy to me and I picked it up. It wasn't for her, it was for me. She didn't need healing, I did. So as she's reading, then faith is rising in my heart and then she, I said, now pray for me. I got healed within three days. Hey, that's amazing. And it wasn't three minutes, it wasn't instantly, but it wasn't three months. So what happened there? I think it was a gift of faith mixed in with a gift of healing. I needed it. She gave it. She had to get it first and then give it. You can't keep it. You can receive a gift and you can keep it. But faith requires that you've got to give it out. What's the use of receiving a gift if you're not going to give it out? And so the gift of faith. Some of you need a gift of faith for what you're facing. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. You know, the translators get it all wrong. Look at this. These English guys, I know what they're talking about. The, the, Greeks, the Greek word is gifts of healings, plural, should be an S there. Why don't they put an S there? Simple, just ask a Greek. <laughs> and it makes sense. It's the plural, because there are many illnesses, many sicknesses, and there are many gifts that he gives. No matter what they are, that can be just, it could be a light illness or it could be a serious illness. There are gifts of healings that flow, and God can flow through you. You see, you think, oh, well, how can God use me? Just test, just test yourself on this. If you have a friend, if you have a neighbour, and you're in a reasonably good relationship with them and they're really sick, I dare you, go and talk with them and tell them, you know, look, you know, I go to church and Christian families, you know, we, we actually pray for sick people. And you know what? Sometimes they get better instantly. Sometimes they get better after a few days. Sometimes they don't get better. And we just rely on the gift of medical science. It's a gift. I said, you know, would you like me to pray for you? Most people don't say, nah, I like being sick. I'm enjoying the pain. Most people who are sick go, oh, yeah? They'll only say no if you're an idiot. And that means you're foolish and you've blown your witness and you've got no credibility with them. Then don't ask them. So if you have a relationship with them and, and that is, they know you're sensible, they know you're, you're, you're basically a good guy, a good girl. And most people go, yeah. And you know what? That's when you say, oh, Lord, i got nothing to give. I need a manifestation of a gift of healing to flow through me. Don't give a guarantee that they'll get healed. That's Jesus' business. Your task is to believe and to step out and to operate and let him do the results. I dare you. I dare you with your neighbour, with the person at work. Very rarely will they say, no, thank you. I enjoy being sick. No, most people who are sick, it's an avenue by which God can, 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 can touch them. To another, prophecy. Miraculous powers. This is miracles. Miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. I mean, like, it's, it's like this inner dis thing where you can discern whether something is of God or is it just of man, or is it could be a bit demonic? And, and, uh, and, and I, I've had that operate uh, in some amazing ways. I remember once with one of our beautiful couples, not in our church anymore, they're in another church, but the, they come up to me and said, oh, Pastor Bill, 
I've got, or they rang me and said, I've got this guy that, that they came across who was in need. And, uh, and they said, look, he's just so needy. And we brought him into our house and, and we're providing for him. And I'm bringing, he's coming to church tonight. Can you meet him? I think, great. So he came to church. It was a Sunday night. No, Sunday, it was actually Sunday morning. And came to church and, and she, they introduced him, a beautiful couple, introduced them to me. And, as he, and I said, hi, what's your name? He said, oh, you know, Philip and, or, or Fred. And I said, yeah, you know, where are you from? And, and then he just starts sharing with me. And, you know, in my head, a little voice goes, lie. And I'm looking at him as he's talking with real compassion. Liar, liar, liar. It's getting louder in my head. Liar, lies, lies. I'm thinking... Bill, you're so unloving. You're so judgmental. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, what's the matter with you? Like, I didn't even realise what was happening. And I went home, and I couldn't shake it. And I'm thinking, what was that about? And then I got the heebie-jeebies. Oh, that's the gift of discerning the spirits. Wow. So I rang the people up. I said, hey, tell me more about this guy. And as he shared with, as they shared with me, I said, I would like to see you guys tonight on your own without him. I said, I just had, I don't have a very good feeling. Could you go and check your valuables in your house? They were already stolen. They were already stolen. And guess what? The demon in him knew that I had discerned and he did a skip. He just took off. So discerning a spirit. So that demon in him knew that I was onto him. So when I contacted the family... He, somehow he just did a skip and ran off. So we got the cops onto him, caught him. He'd done it to another person down south. So the cops were after him. Praise the Lord, a good prison term does the person the world of good. <laughs> so look, that's just, that's just a bit weird, but it was like, I, I just think, don't think it's something outside. And this is not the gift of suspicion. This is not for you to go around and go, hmm, hmm, <laughs> uh, you know, no, 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 this is not the gift. It's just like, You've got to be non-judgmental and loving. It's just discernment. And um, it ha- it, you know, I've had some, some weird experiences. There was once when I, when I healed a haunted house. Hey, this house was haunted. <laughs> and so these people rang me, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and they told me this unbelievable story. And, I said, and, and they, they just saw my name in the phone book, and they thought, oh, that, they were Catholics. And they thought, oh, this is the local Catholic priest. So they said, Father, Father Vasilakis, uh, can we come and see you? And I said, why? Because there's a haunted house that we're in. And it's like, so they told me the story and I, I didn't know. So I said, look. So anyway, I got them to come around to my house. They were about 15 minutes away. They were there in five minutes. They're like this. So I said, you can't smoke in my house. I've got kids. And they t- 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 they're just shaking. And they're telling me the story. It was unbelievable. Anyway, so I just shared the gospel with them. I didn't know if it was true or not. I just thought, oh, well. I shared the gospel that Jesus has won the victory. Satan's under our feet. And when you put your faith in him, you can cast out that demon from the house. I'm just preaching to them. And they said, okay. So they accepted Christ then and there. Just, yes, we need. And they said, and I said, now go back and cast out that demon in Jesus' name. You've got authority. No, 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 no. You come, you come. <laughs> so I had to go. Oh, it was funny. So anyway, they go to the house and, and they're all behind me. They gave me the key and they're like, and I said, well, where is it? He goes, in that room. I said, oh, come on. You go, open up. No, 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 you go. So I <laughs> opened up the room. And uh, it was interesting because the house was warm. That room was like an icebox. Yeah. And then the hairs on the back of my head went, mmm. That's the that's gift of discerning of spirits. And I said, okay, we're gonna, I told him what I'm going to do. I was going to pray in tongues in every room. I told him about salvation, water, baptism, baptism of the Spirit. They wanted everything. They wanted everything God had to offer because they were in need. I could have done anything to them. So I said, okay, I'm going to start speaking in tongues now. You know what that is. Don't be freaked out. So I went in every room, and then I said, I'm going to cast out any demon out of that place. So I just went through it. And I went to that room, and this is fair thinking. And I just said, in the name of Jesus. You rotten demon, get out of this house. And then all of a sudden, on the ceiling, you hear this boom, 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 boom. And they scream, that's it! And they ran out of the house. <laughs> so, so, so I said, come back inside. I said, we've prayed in Jesus' name. I said, this house is free now. 
said, you're believers in Jesus, you trust him, and if it comes back again and you hear them just say, get out in Jesus' name, you have authority. And they, they got saved and were attending church for a period of time. Then they stopped coming. I don't know what happened, but, you know, they got free. I was able to bless them. But that's a gift of discerning of spirits, gift of faith. I mean, it's a bit weird, but it's real. It happened to me. I hope it doesn't happen to you. Oh, I tell you. To another, different, another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. Paul is particularly to the, the context here is in the Corinthian church, for some reason, they had a fascination with the gift of tongues. To the point where they'd come together. So you imagine this morning our, our song service, and that Nathan, Alyssa, and then Nathan, and then me. All that we did when you came here was speak in tongues and worship using the gift of tongues. And, and, and you've come here. And that's all we're doing? We're having a wonderful worship experience on our own, but we're not edifying you. We're not helping you. You've, you've come, there are people who don't know Jesus or people who are struggling in areas of their life. So Paul says, listen, when people come together for church, there's got to be intelligible speech. He says, look, I'm all for speaking in tongues. He says, in fact, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. He goes, but listen, guys, you've got to preach the word. You've got to have fellowship. You've got to share. There's got to be intelligible speech. You've got unbelievers there. They, he calls them inquirers. He actually says, those who don't believe, those who are inquiring, and those who are believers. He says, you've got to make sure that you, your constituency, you minister to them. And so then he's saying to them, look, guys, if, if you, when you come together as believers, if the gift of tongues operates and somebody wants to speak, make sure there's an interpreter. And then just do it three times, that's it. Just have a part of the service, and, and usually geared for just when there's believers. So when we have our believers gatherings, like our, our church-wide team, not say, hey, if someone's got a gift of tongues, and gift of interpretation, just go for it. It can be done in a public setting like this, but because when the building's too big and too large a facility, it's, it's more difficult to regulate. But that's why Paul says, and you read 1 Corinthians 14, he goes, look, if you do it, three of you and then three interpret. But the gift of tongues for personal private use is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a gift, a manifestation of the spirit, the gift of tongues in the public thing. And then he says interpretation. And notice this, all these, all these, the nine of them, are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one. Each one of you can receive them, just as he determines. They're not for self, but for others. In other words, every one of us can receive and use them to do good. Look at again at verse, the first verse, verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To do as much good to people who need help for today and need some hope for tomorrow. And that's everyone on planet Earth. So I liken these gifts to the power to speak supernaturally. Tongues, interpretation and prophecy. Power to speak supernaturally. The power to know. Knowledge, wisdom and discernment of spirits supernaturally and the power to do supernaturally faith healing and miracles and you can be used by the holy spirit to manifest each one of these folks you really can and let me say this the gift of tongues is the door that opens for us the it's the, it's the doorway by which we can walk through to actually see all these gifts operate and there are some, it's interesting, objectively, when I look at churches that say, oh, no, no, we just want the Holy Spirit for fruit to become more like Christ. And they say, oh, the gifts, oh, they died out with the early church. They did? Where did I get that theory from? Paul, Paul and Jesus didn't say that. Well, if that's what they go for, we just want all the fruit and no gifts. You know what happens? No gifts. But churches that go, you know what? This baptism in the Holy Spirit, this hotline to heaven that I can receive... When they go for it, you know what happens? It's like a door opens and all the gifts start to manifest themselves and operate amazingly, wonderfully. I never get bored praying for people to receive this baptism in, in the Holy Spirit. Look, next Sunday, next Sunday, we're going to have a very special encounter Sunday. Well, actually, next Friday morning as well, the four services. Friday morning, early. We're going to build time into our services. It's a 20-minute time where we're going to have an encounter time where the singers are going to lead us and we're going to be able to... If you haven't received this baptism in the Spirit and the gift of being able to speak in a new prayer language, we'll give you an opportunity to receive. 
And then we've got a special encounter afternoon, 1.30 till 3, so you can go home or have lunch and come back here so we're not restricted where we're going to have a time of just being filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit because we need all that God's got to offer. I want all the fruit and I want all the gifts. Not for me, but for others. And so the final thing I want to say is this. How do I activate my faith to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? We've got to get the balance right. You know what? There are four key words. And these four words are love, desire, ask, and receive. Love, desire, ask, and receive. Two scriptures. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 14.1. This is what I call a hinge verse. A hinge verse holds a doorway. It closes the door and it can open the door. And this verse kind of finishes up what Paul is saying about love, the whole love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, and then he introduces with the gift of tongues and prophecy, chapter 14. And he says, follow the way of love. And what? Earnestly, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. To operate these spiritual gifts, we must make sure that our motives are right, and love is the only motive. Love for God, love for people. God's glory, people's welfare. And we need to develop a strong desire, hungering, thirsting, as Jesus says in Matthew 5. He who hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled. We need strong desire to move in this spiritual realm. If you don't desire to operate gifts, have a guess what? They ain't going to operate. If you're just satisfied, I'm going to follow the way of love. I'm not going to earnestly desire the gifts. Well, that's exactly, you get what you go for. According to your faith, so be it to you. But if you're saying, I want all the fruit flowing through me, I want to become more like Christ, and I want all the gifts, I want to be ministered like Christ, it'll start happening to you. So he says here, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Wow. And then you've got to ask, <laughs> and in asking, it's got to be asking in faith to receive. Have a look at this in Luke 11. I love this. Jesus says, for everyone who asks, doesn't receive he who seeks may find if God wills it no for everyone who asks what receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened and then he says look how many of you dads and mums if your kids ask for a piece of fish you're not going to give them a snake or if they ask for egg, you're not going to give them a score. But my wife cooked some beautiful omelette this morning with tomatoes and onions, and it was just oh, beautiful, as she would say, to die for. I, and I said, sweet, I'd love an omelette. Imagine if she just put a rock on that plate. <laughs> or a scorpion. I'd say, man, I think we've got some problems here. I need an exorcist in the house, please. Something wrong. No, no, no. He goes, even those of you that are wackos, even those of you that are evil prisoners, they do good things to their kids. Even the most hardened criminals love their kids. It's true. That's why convicted pedophiles are never put in the main prison. They'll last about an hour. They'll be killed. Because those men go, you did, the, you did what to that child? It could be my child. That's the authorities put him in a special place. So he says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to, in other words, you're, you're a criminal, you're in prison, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He so wants you to, to have the, the, the gift of the Spirit. Listen, if you prepare yourself, grab my booklet on baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's on the table there where my books are in there. Read it. Read the scriptures. Fill yourself with knowledge from God's word. Come to a place during the week and say, you know what, I think I believe it. And then see the practical section, how to receive. And if you come expecting, you have knowledge, you have faith is rising, and, and you come expecting for this service in that 20-minute time, we'll say at 1.30. I'm telling you, before I pray for you, you won't be able to speak in tongues. After I pray for you, you will be able to. Why? Because I did the filling? No. Jesus does it. I'm just the midwife. I'm just giving you permission. I'm going to help you. In fact, you could read this and get filled during the week. I got filled four o'clock in the morning on my bed because I had some people trying to give it to me, and they were just weird. 
when I was a young Christian, they were weird and like they did some strange things. I'll talk about it next week. But so I just received on my own with Jesus. You can receive on your own. You don't need me. You don't need the pastors. You don't need, but this helps us. It becomes a means in a loving, safe environment where you can receive. So I guarantee you, read this. If you haven't received, and you will receive, if you have faith to believe that God is true to his word, and when we lay hands upon you, you will be able to speak in this new prayer language as God gives you the ability. So love for God and people. Desire, just put those four words, desire to be used to help somebody. Ask God in faith. And then receive these gifts that need to be passed on. There are lots of people that get baptised in the Holy Spirit. And uh, there's testimonies. And Rachel Lane, Rachel, come up here and share with us. You've got a little microphone. Uh, Rachel's a wonderful young woman. And um, she's smart. She's actually, you're a psychologist now? Uh, not technically. Not, not quite, technically. But you, you're on the way. Yeah. So, so if you need some psych help, she's the girl to see. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> she's a musician. She's an extraordinary wonderful lover of Jesus and when she leads us in worship I, I just think you, you're wonderful but Rachel tell us your story of what happened with you being able to receive this this gift of, of tongues um yeah so I received the gift of speaking in tongues when I was in year 12 I think so I'm 22 now so it was a little while ago um and I had been following Jesus seriously for about a year before that um and so I was in youth group and um I it, speaking in tongues was something that I saw a lot of my youth leaders doing. Um, I saw pastors doing it. And I was kind of um, in, I had the attitude of Jesus had completely transformed my life. Um, and yeah, I had the attitude of God, whatever you have for me, I just want it. Um, whatever, if there's anything else that's part of this whole Jesus thing, anything else that's part of this faith thing, if it's going to draw me closer to you, I just want that. Um, and so I had a real kind of soft heart and um, just a desire for anything that was of God. Um, and so I didn't exactly have that much knowledge about anything, but I wanted whatever God had for me. And so, um, yeah, it was something that I saw a lot of my youth leaders doing. And so I started praying for it. Um, and I read up a little bit about it. And I, all I really knew was that it was something that um, they did in the Bible. And it was something that people were still doing today. And it was something that would draw me closer to Jesus. Um, and, and I wanted it. And so I started praying for it and I had a hunger for it. Um, and then it was one Sunday night, um, I came down the front to get prayer and a pastor I knew prayed for me and, um, uh, he prayed that I would receive the gift of speaking in a, a new spiritual language. Um, and then I went back to my seat, um, and it was a, it was a time of extended worship. So everyone was kind of just doing their own thing, praying and, and worshiping. And so I was at my seat and I was just... Um, praying to God in English um, under my breath. And then I felt, um, I guess, the most uh, strong sense of the Holy Spirit that I'd ever experienced. Um, and physi the physiological things that are accompanied with me when I um, sense the Holy Spirit, it was like next level. Like it was, um, yeah, the most that I had experienced the Holy Spirit um, before in my faith. Um, and so I was just praying in my seat in English and um, under my breath. And then at one point, it just switched um, where I didn't know what I was praying anymore. Um, and I, it just wasn't in English. Um, and so that was a really significant experience in my faith. It was like, it was like the start of a new, um, I guess, um, era in my faith. Um, but like what often happens, and I've spoken to a lot of um, of my youth girls that have had this similar experience where I went home after that experience um, and I guess not being in that atmosphere of faith or not being in that atmosphere of being open to the spirit, I started doubting um, and I started questioning and I started kind of just overthinking and freaking out. Um, and I have this real thing about um, wanting everything to be really authentic and real. And so I started stressing out that I was making it up and I started stressing out that... Um, it was all in my head. And that was that thing that I actually experienced, was that actually what I thought it was? Um, and so I was scared. Like I was actually scared of the idea of the Holy Spirit and the idea of speaking in tongues. Um, and so I just didn't use it for like six months, which is so sad looking back now. And I wish that I had just asked somebody quest the questions that I had about it and about who the Holy Spirit is. I wish that I had asked people in my life. Um, 
but yeah, I didn't utilise the gift for probably about six months. Um, and then we had another series similar to this one where we were talking about the Holy Spirit and just kind of unpacking who he is and what he looks like. Um, and then God just kind of opened my eyes to who the Holy Spirit actually is. Um, and I felt so silly afterwards. Like I was like, why was I so afraid of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is literally just like Jesus? And like, yeah. I know Jesus. Yeah, I love Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Why am I freaking out about the Holy Spirit? Um, and yeah, so he just kind of opened my eyes and just gave me this, this kind of sense of, of peace over this idea of speaking in tongues and that... Um, what all of my youth leaders had been telling me about, you know, musical gifts and leadership gifts is that in order for them to grow, you have to use them. Like, you have to step out, and the more that you use them, the more that they grow. And I realised that that was similar with this gift yeah, um, and right. that the more that I used it, when I actually stepped out and in my personal prayer time with Jesus, I started using it again. And the more that I used it, the more confident I became with using yeah, it, um, right. the, the more that it grew and the more edifying it was for me. Um, and now I use it every single day. Like I was literally sitting next to Sam, speaking under my breath because I was freaking out about being up here. Like I use it every single day if I'm <laughs> nervous or, yeah, like every single day I use it and it edifies yeah. me and, and helps me in my faith. Wonderful. So. Put your hands together for Rachel. <laughs> hey, Rachel, there are times when I freak out too and I'm there speaking in tongues on my own before I get up to speak. So that's quite normal. You know, the, um, and I said that it's a doorway for all the other gifts. Um, I've thought about this a lot, and, and, um, and the question that, that I, I raised with the Lord myself was, well, Jesus, how come you didn't speak in tongues? There's no evidence in the four Gospels. And it really hit me, uh, and to answer that question makes it more, more pertinent that I need to, because Jesus didn't speak in tongues because he didn't need to. His tongue was always under the control of his heart and mind. He never sinned. He had perfect control. And um, whereas I'm the opposite, I'm out of control. I say the wrong things at the wrong time to the wrong people. My heart is conflicted. We all are like that. We're born in sin. And so when he gives this new gift, as, as Peter said in Acts 2, he goes, man, they're speaking in tongues. There's no reference to speaking in tongues in the Old Testament. But Peter says... This is what Joel's talking about when Joel says, in the last days, the Holy Spirit's going to come on all people, young men, old men, young girls, old girls. It's on everyone. It's like God's God, everyone's going to be an oracle to God. You don't need a temple. You don't need a building. You don't need a liturgy. This is like God and you. And Peter goes, this is that. This is so speaking in tongues is a form of prophecy. It's a new sign for a new era, to launch this era of the Spirit, this, this era of grace. So every time I speak in tongues, and I endeavour to speak in tongues every day, the more you do it, you're stepping out in faith. And it's actually the means by which you step out to operate wisdom, knowledge, healing, faith. Okay, so therefore, I'm stepping out and I'm speaking in a language I have not learnt. It bypasses my mind. I have to yield control of my will and my vocal cords to allow the spirit to inspire speech, okay? And this is where people get confused. And in my little booklet, you'll see that. It, speaking in tongues is not going into a trance. God's going to speak through me. That's weird. Like, will you lose control and do weird... No, 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 no. I'm out of control. I need the controlling, healing influence of the spirit I yield control of what I'm going to say to him and as I speak I step out and I speak the spirit engages so that if you step out in faith he will step in with his power so the gift of tongues is a permanent gift that reminds me of the reality that now heaven is on the inside Jesus lives within and I have the same thing the first Christians had. So therefore, the same principle that I'm talking to this couple on the phone. Lord, I need your wisdom. I'm stepping out. Enable me. Or well, this person needs healing. Or well, this person needs... I'm stepping out. And, uh, and so, you, you, so don't confuse speaking in tongues with somehow you will lose control. You'll do weird and wonderful things. No, not at all. Uh, I was out of control as a teenager you know, with drugs and, and, and alcohol and, and, and sex and, 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 you know, just terrible stuff. 
I was out of control. And when I became a Christian, I came under the control of Jesus through the Spirit. And speaking in tongues is the means by which I say, Lord, if you can control this most unruly member, control these hands, control these eyes, control these minds, control this heart, control these desires, I, I yield to you. And it's the means by which it's the doorway so that you can operate all the gifts that flow through you. So it's a very special gift. If people say, oh, you're Pentecostal, all you do is speak in tongues. Well, how often do I? I, I speak about Jesus. Number one, the gift of speaking in tongues is a means to an end. The most important thing is salvation through Christ and having the Holy Spirit on the inside. But I'd be lying to you to say you can be a fully functional New Testament Christian without the gifts. You read the book of Acts. It's not possible. To be a New Testament functioning Christian, we need all the gifts, the charismata, because our world is full of need. People are in diabolical states. And we have to be Jesus to them. And, you ne and they need the gifts of the Spirit flowing through you. That's why we're doing the series on the Spirit. And so next week, you know, if you're a little bit dry and you haven't been using the gift of tongues, I dare you this week just to start speaking, just, just for three or four minutes, five minutes a day, just quietly to yourself and, and rejuvenate yourself. If you haven't received, look, read the booklet. Study up, reflect, pray, come believing and expecting. And you know, God will do some amazing things. We know people that just start walking down the aisle and they're speaking in tongues. Hey, I had some, some, some unusual people who were not wise and not based on scripture. And I'll give the story there. And, and they, one of them was an older man. And I, for me to receive this, the spirit, he just turned me off. He was trying to do it for me. Shaking my head like my head was being shaken and just weird. And, and I, at the end, I turned off. And it was a wise pastor that spoke to me. He says, Bill, he goes, no, nah. he goes, I think the Lord wants to fill you on his own. Because I had these three or four people with bad experiences. They were, they were just unwise, untrained. None of our pastors and leaders do things like that. We train everyone. So I received on my own, four o'clock in the morning, just Jesus and I. And it was beautiful. It was the most wonderful thing for a couple of hours. I'm just, he just, I, just was, I got so excited. I jumped out of bed and opened the light and looked in the mirror and saw myself speaking in tongues and jumped back into bed and put the pillow over me so I wouldn't wake up my parents. And I'm in control, but I'm excited, you know, because I've been wanting. And, and so the Lord can do it to you directly. And it is the baptism of the Spirit. It's being immersed in the Spirit. Jesus does it. And this gift, but we're here to help you and enable you to be able to cross over the line. And uh, so I, I trust that, that uh, for those of you that haven't received, you will. And those of you that have, but you're not using it, you'll get refired. Let's stand together and uh, as we sing a song and bring our service to this finale. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Rachel's testimony that inspires us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to share your word of truth. And I pray, Lord, that may the word that's been shared today inspire and encourage and inform and empower people to see beyond themselves. And may there be even a, a quickening of faith in people's hearts to say, yes, I want this for me. I want to enjoy the fullness of the Spirit's giftings flowing through me to be able to help other people. So, Father, I pray, fill us to overflowing with the Holy Spirit and with power. Enable us to be the most effective witnesses we can be as part of the Christian Family Centre. Help us to be the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece and the heart of Jesus to people in need in our world. I pray, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive all that you have for us. Let's sing a song.